Hi, everyone. Welcome to another novel at home. We are thrilled to be here tonight with Susan Cushman and Jeffrey Blunt. Um, this is over a year of virtual events and I think almost exactly a year for Novel at Home specifically. Um, fun fact, we got kicked off a year ago with Susan Cushman, who was kind enough to appear in conversation with Claire Fullerton to launch Little T. I think that was like June 18th last year. Yeah, I forgot. I was looking back, I was like, wait a second, that was exactly a year. So happy anniversary. Um, <laughs> And as everyone's trickling in, I'll just go over the way this is gonna work. Um, I'll do intros and then uh, Susan and Jeffrey will appear in conversation. As you're listening to them, if you think of questions that you would like to ask either of the authors, you can, um, if you wanna go, could be bottom or top of your screen, you'll find a Q&A box. And that's where you will enter your specific questions for them. Then I'll come back at the end and read them the questions. Um, in the meantime, if you wanna find close to that on your toolbar is your chat box. And that's where you can um, feel free to give shout outs, say hello, any other comments. Um, and I'll also be dropping links to purchase the author's books in the chat box as well. So we are excited to have with us tonight, um, Jeffrey Blunt, this is the first time we've ever gotten to do this with him because, uh, you know, the nature of virtual events we were just saying allows us to just log in and travel arrangements don't have to be made or any of that. So we really appreciate you being here with us tonight. My pleasure. Um, Jeffrey has uh, three novels. His um, latest is The Emancipation of Evan Walls that came out last year. And he's also got Almost Snow White and Hating Heidi Foster. Um, he has also had a prolific writing career, writing for publications like Huffington Post, Washington Post, TheRio.com, uh, on top of a 34-year career at NBC News uh, as an Emmy award-winning director uh, for such, you know, tiny programs like The Today Show, Meet the Press, <laughs> NBC Nightly News, you may have heard of those. Um, and he's done script writing for award-winning documentaries and you can read all about him at jeffreyblunt.com. And we also have his books at Novel and NovelMemphis.com. Welcome, Jeffrey, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me, I'm glad to be here. And we are here tonight to launch Susan Cushman's latest novel, John and Mary Margaret. Mm -hmm. And Susan is a longtime friend of the bookstore, bookstores, I should say. Um, you know, novel's been around since 2017, but we have been able to host her, I think for uh, just about every book you've done, this is her seventh book and wow. her second novel. Um, her other novel is Cherry Bomb. Um, I know we did an event for that. Uh, Susan was also kind enough to host a writing workshop for us in the early days of novel. Um, Susan also has a book of short stories called Friends of the Library and a memoir called Tangles and Plaques, A Mother and Daughter Face Alzheimer's and has edited three anthologies. So she stays very busy. <laughs> um, she's born in Jackson, Mississippi, and, but has been a Memphian for over 30 years. So we, we thank you for being here tonight, Susan. And we are so grateful for the relationship we've had over the years and love hosting events with you and getting to hang out with you. Um, so yeah, I'm going to get out of the way. And again, if you know you have questions, just pop those in the Q&A box and I'll be back at the end. Thanks so much. Thanks, thanks Nicole. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for having us. No, yes. Great bookstore and uh, I consider it now my second hometown bookstore since I have been in Memphis for over 30 years. Well, it's, it's wonderful to have a, a relationship with a bookstore um, that close and um, you know, you respecting them being there for you and, and you putting something on the shelves for their readers to purchase and buy. And today's a very special night um, because it's the launch of John and, and Mary Margaret. I've got my copy. Yeah, and I want to say your background, your whole setup there is really nice, Susan. I'm, 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 I'm taking notes. <laughs> it's my office. Yeah, well, it looks nice. Thanks. So 
Um, I, you know, this is, I, I, we, we've spoken before and I, I told you that I thought that this was a lovely novel. And I said, I used the word lovely because it, um, it, it was just, it was pleasing in about every way that you could find it to be. Um, and it was a um, amazing representation of our humanity for each other. Um, and, uh, you know, the, what love means and, and the power of love. Um, and so uh, it was a great pleasure to read it. And I'm, I'm thankful that you allowed me that opportunity to read before, before, before tonight and then to come and have this conversation with you. Thank you. So this beautiful story is about, it exhibits many truths um, from our lives as human beings. And we're gonna discuss some of those, but like all good stories, we start at the beginning. So I know that John and Mary Margaret has a beginning here in this book of short stories. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about um, how the story originated and how you took it from short story, why you took it from short story to novel? Yes, thanks, Jeffrey. Thanks so much for being here and for all your help. You know, Friends of the Library is a short story collection um, that came out in 2019. And it happened because my novel Cherry Bomb in 2017, my publisher, who's from Mississippi, asked me to visit Friends of the Library groups in small towns in Mississippi to speak about Cherry Bomb. And as I was doing that, I was so fascinated with the towns. I'm from Jackson, Mississippi, but I had never visited places like Eupora and Pontotoc and West Point and a whole bunch of these places. So I studied about them before I visited them so that I could find that special antebellum home or that blues museum or that right. famous site you know, in each place. And then when I got home from each of those visits, my in inclination was to write a blog post because I've had a blog for years. Right. But something in me said, wait, what if instead of writing a blog post, you use your imagination and you write a short story? So I created a Dale Covington, a fictional author, and had her going on this book tour and had her meet some really interesting, um, eclectic, but wounded people in each of these towns. And she reached out to them to help them. And um, in, in the, the story about John and Mary Margaret, which was actually not set in Oxford, Mississippi, where the Ole Miss campus is, it started in Senatobia, Mississippi at a book club, but then it was also set in Oxford. So they fell in love on the Ole Miss campus in 1966, which wouldn't have been a problem except that he was black and she was white. He was from Memphis and she was from Jackson, Mississippi. And so, of course, that was verboten in 1966 um, on the Ole Miss campus. And so I wrote a short story about it. And that was all there was to it. It was just one of 10 short stories. But more than one of my readers of those short stories emailed me and said, why don't you turn the story about John and Mary Margaret into a novel? We think there is more meat in this story and, and it needs a longer narrative arc. So why don't you turn it into a novel? So, you know, about this time it was the pandemic was going on, it was 2020. And also a lot of the social injustice protests and a lot was going on with all of that. So I thought this is the perfect time to write this book. This is a way I can have a voice. If I had been younger, and it had not been COVID, I would have gone out and joined the protests. You know, right. thankfully there were some nonviolent protests in Memphis that were wonderfully done. But I'm 70 years old, <laughs> and I wasn't going to go out there uh, with COVID, you know, and do that. So my husband said, "Well, write it. Of course, you know, you have a voice. Write it." So as I expanded the short story in the middle of the pandemic. Um, I studied a whole lot about um, the history of civil rights movement in Mississippi and Memphis. And I think I cited about 18 sources in the back of the book. Right. It was such an eye opener. We'll, well, we'll, we'll, let, we'll talk about some of that as we move along. But before, I wonder if you can tell us what your readers thought was so powerful about the story that it needed to be expanded. I, I get that they loved it. They wanted more of it. And when I read the short story, I also singled that story out of your book. But I wonder um, why some of your other readers felt it was important to let you know it should uh, become a novel. Yeah, one of them said they wanted more of the backstories of the two characters. 
you know, which you didn't have time for in a short right. story. So I went back to the 1950s to their childhoods in the book, but to, to, you know, to try to give it more of that meat. Right. And um, another one wanted more of the specifics that what happened in the 60s and 70s on the campus with the protests. Uh, I don't think any of them asked me about more detail of bringing it forward, but it comes all the way up to 2020, the book right. does. So I don't remember the specifics. They just said, please expand it into a book. Yeah, I just wondered because, you know, Ed, it's, it's being a, a Southerner and understanding, you know, the relationships um, over the years um, between Blacks and Whites and um, to, to take on that subject matter is, um, you know, some people might say, oh, she's, she's reaching out there and it's a little, little crazy to go that far. On the other hand, being in a interracial relationship, um, for me, uh, I was pleased that you went there. I was pleased that you took the opportunity to speak to um, love as a universal feeling that isn't attached to, it isn't color coded. Um, it's something that we all are, it overcomes us all, it takes us all. And, you know, we want to recognize it no matter what the situation is. Right. So, and I think that their meeting points that out. And I, and I, and you gave it, you gave it breath, you gave it life, um, and and t and took a risk risk to do so. I think as a writer, um, what do you think about that? Was there much of a risk for you? Did you think? I didn't think it at the time. It's interesting. I've only thought it recently as I've started doing interviews. Right. And people are asking me about it, and and you know before I just thought I'm just telling a beautiful story. I'm dedicating it to my four mixed race granddaughters. I have a black son-in-law and two Asian adopted children, and I'm dedicating the book to, to them. So it, it all came out of love. And I've had several friends say, well, what about pushback? Aren't you getting some pushback for writing this, especially as a white woman writing about, about, about black, black man who's one of the protagonists. And actually, I was really glad, Jeffrey, that you shared a wonderful article with me yeah. from the Wall Street Journal by... Um, James Campbell writing in the Wall Street yep. Journal, and he wrote about um, he wrote about James Baldwin as well. But he's writing about cultural appropriation and whether or not it's okay for people of different races to write about the other. And I actually want to read one little quote from that because this sure. really struck me. Yeah. Writers on each side of the color line have more than just the right to cross the divide and report back. It is their duty. Imaginative life depends on cultural exchange. Literature depend, depends on the imagination. To put it another way, culture is cultural appropriation. Any artist worth the name should be willing to take a punch for it. So I yeah. guess that's what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I agree 100%, as you know. And um, I think that if you have Toni Morrison and James Baldwin, who are both in that article, saying that authors should be able to write whatever they want to write, I think is um, you're in good company. And I, I also agree with you in the sense that, um, you know, uh, if, you, if you are reaching, I think most authors are trying to do the best that they can do in, in, in creating their characters and, and putting their characters in a situation to, to make the story happen that they want to happen, to make the statement that they want to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think when we write across, you know, my book, Hating Heidi Foster is, is a, 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 you know, a man, when I wrote it in my 50s, writing about teenage girls. Um, so when you write across those lines, you put yourself in that position to learn more. Mm -hmm. And then when you learn more, you transfer that to your readers. So I think in some ways, it's a very special thing that you take the risk to cross over to tell that because obviously it brought something to you. And it's what one of the beautiful things I like about this story is that you were able to, to bring what you learned um, in educating us about both characters uh, in this story, which we will get to, but maybe you, before I get carried away, you should tell us, give us a synopsis of the book um, so you can, you can help me. When I hear what you, what you say, then I'll know where I can't go. I don't want to ruin anything for folks. Yeah, well, I think I've already said that, that from the beginning that yep. they fall in love on the Ole Miss campus. Right. Um, um, John and Mary Margaret and they're freshmen at Ole Miss. 
uh, and it doesn't work out then, you know, and the, the book carries forward 35 more years as um, in Memphis, they both end up in Memphis, I will say that and live separate lives, you know, for, for quite a while there. And the way they find each other and why they find each other, I'm not going to say. Right. Um, because that's that would be too much of a spoiler. Right. How that all works out. But it was a great opportunity for me to learn and research the civil rights movement during those years. And one thing I loved doing was interspersing real events, even though it's a fictional book. It's a novel. Right. And I, I love doing that um, and having that be part of it, you know, having John um, be part of the Black Student Union at Ole Miss and having he and some of his friends go to Memphis when Martin Luther King was there giving his speech, you know, and some of those events. Well, you have a number of cameo appearances in the book, <laughs> historical. You want to talk about a couple of those? Yeah, I think my favorite one is Eudora Welty. Yes. Um, I, lived, yeah. I lived in her neighborhood, in the Bellhaven neighborhood in Jackson, Mississippi, as a newlywed in the early 70s, just a few blocks from where she lived. She lived right across the street from Bellhaven College, where I went after I was at Ole Miss. And I never knocked on her door. I was always <laughs> too shy to do that, even though I, I heard that neighborhood children could knock on her door and she would give them popsicles in the summer. And they called her the popsicle lady. <laughs> so I decided to have Mary Margaret as a young teenager when she's four and lives in that neighborhood, have her meet um, Eudora Welty at the local Jitney Jungle grocery store and help her with her groceries and end up going home with her. So they have a visit then and another visit a year or two later. And Eudora Welty is important in Mary Margaret's life in helping open her eyes to what's going on with race and issues of race. Because Mary Margaret's from uh, old money, white, prominent right. family, very conservative. And so there was a lot that she was unaware of. And Eudora Welty plays an important part there. And so you bring me to something that I always love to take apart when I read a novel. First, I like to just read it uh, because I love good books and I love being moved and touched by beautiful stories. But then as a writer, I try to, I try to figure out what the author has done that's made a very special story like your story come to life. Mm -hmm. And you, you know, some of the devices you use, Eudora Welty being one, um, you, and you, you already touched on how you used that device. You bring this writer into or Mary Margaret is, is bold enough and to, you know, and to go back to, to meet her and you use her to educate Mary Margaret. Right. And then you educate the reader one step removed from Mary Margaret as she goes through her life and she starts to put into place or recognize things she hadn't recognized until Eudora Welty came into her life. So those kinds of devices, I think, are, are just pretty special. I know there is, I have, there's one quote that I want to read. And then I know there's an, another quote that um, we have talked about that I think we should share. But I, so you not only use her, but you use James Baldwin, Richard Wright, um, and uh, Faulkner. Um, so you have, you have these incredible writers um, with quotes that pull from your story um, and make the reader think as you're going from chapter to chapter. I love this part. Of, I love that you did this. Thank and you. every time I read one of the quotes, I just took a moment to think about it in context with the story before I went into the next chapter. I'm so happy you did it. So right. art is never the voice of a country. It is an even more precious thing. The voice of the individual doing its best to speak, not comfort of any sort, but truth. Can you elaborate on that a little bit and why you chose that one? Well, I think in a way, um, Miss Welty empowered me to, to write the book and to tell the story. And, and yet to also make it art. Yeah. You know, it has to be art too. It can't just be confessional. It can't just be, uh, well, I didn't want to write it just as history. Plenty of people have done that and will continue to do that. Yeah, but she inspired me, which is why I have so many quotes from her right. uh, throughout the book. You know. Okay, and there's one that I think really um, speaks to the times that we're in. It speaks to writing in general, but then it speaks to the time that we're in. Do you have your hand on that? If not, I can read it to you. Um, 
Every writer. Thank yeah, you. yeah, that one. Yeah. Now put this in my author's note in the back of the book. Every okay. writer, like everybody else, thinks he's living through the crisis of the ages. To write honestly and with all our powers is the least we can do and the most. And I felt like I was living through the crisis of the ages yeah. when I wrote this in the middle of the pandemic. The combination of the COVID crisis and also the racial crisis, which on the one hand, some terrible things were happening. On the other hand, some wonderful things were happening yeah, in the nation yeah. and in my heart because I was having an awakening. Yeah, you know, yeah. and part of that awakening was reading other materials. And I just have to say that probably the one of the most important books that I have ever read that I read last summer was Cast. That Absolutely. Is a, yeah. It's a master class. Yeah. <laughs> race in this country in nazi germany um in um india it's just amazing yeah, so, yeah. I, I i agree um and so um one other i'll talk, talk about one other device and that is the author adele who is really her story in the friends of the library and now she becomes in many ways um a, a character in the background and while we we know her and but she comes in and elicits the story Right. So she helps them tell us their life story. Right. And first of all, I just love the settings. You know, you go from different settings with them, even to different places in the house um, and, and what they do and what they drink. It's all very, the, um, the, the settings and the feeling uh, and adds to the flavor of the book, uh, adds to the, the, the culture uh, of the story. So I, I loved all of that. And um, uh, and and did it did it hurt a little bit to minimize Adele from book to book? Oh, not at all. And and um, in fact, I mean, I, Adele is a lot me. You know, she really is yeah. me throughout it. And even the the opening chapter, which happens in a book club yeah. in my neighborhood here in Memphis <laughs> on the Mississippi River, Harbor Town, and I've spoken to a book club here in the neighborhood. So when I had her speaking to the book club and had John and Mar Mary Margaret be there. I just felt like I was there, you know, in the middle of it. And what I did um, in deciding how to continue to use Adele, as I had in Friends of the Library, to use her as a narrator, I went back and read the book, The Notebook, um, okay. because I remembered how the character of Noah wrote in his notebook and read those stories to Allie, his wife, when right. she had Alzheimer's. Right. I wanted to see what kind of structure he used and I read it and I took notes on it and yeah. it was in my mind when I wrote it. And recently um, a reviewer on Instagram compared the book to the notebook. <laughs> I had no idea that I had done that, you know. Yeah. But, uh, we do learn the craft from others, Absolutely. you know, who use devices like Absolutely. that. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about your characters. Um, Mary Margaret um, is a multifaceted, um, uh, has many levels in her personality and her thought process. And, 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 and as she goes through life, um, she is open-minded when confronted with new things, um, which speaks to something good about her. Uh, and I wonder, you can talk to uh, more about her backstory, but if you can also touch on why you gave her the ability to be open-minded as opposed to even her mom um, or you know, other friends, um, the Shannon, her roommate, why she was able to accept you know, things from Eudora Welty and, uh, and, other, and other readings and things that she'd done to open her mind. Right. Well, there are a lot of things that Mary Margaret and I share, uh, in addition to both being from Jackson, Mississippi and both pledging Tridel sorority at Ole Miss and coming from a little bit similar backgrounds. Um, I had a real sensitivity about race when I was a child. And we had a black maid named Lily Bell that I adored from the time I can remember until I was about 10 or older. And I remember being uncomfortable with the fact that she called my brother and I, Miss Susan and Mr. Mike, and my parents, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson, and we just called her Lily Bell. And we didn't call her Mrs. Williams, you know, or whatever. So I wrote a scene in the book where Mary Margaret has that same thinking. Then I have her maid, Lily Bell, <laughs> and I have her have a conversation with her about that and about why. And um, so that's just an example of how something from my life, um, I kind of fleshed it out a little bit 
through Mary Margaret's life. You know, we were alike. And, and the other way we were alike is we both wanted to be writers. I wanted to be a writer right. from junior high, wrote on newspaper staff in high school, and so did she, you know, and had, had her writing on the Daily Memphian at Ole Miss, right. um, and loving literature. So she and John meet in uh, a freshman uh, English class, and they both love William Faulkner, and they're studying for a Faulkner exam together, you know, in one of the scenes. So that's what draws them together. Well, and, Faulkner is a pretty good thing to fall in love over. I, I could, I agree with that. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Um, but you, so she, she has this background that you say is, is, is sort of similar to yours. Um, but, and then you, one, she falls in love with this African-American boy. And then she ends up in some situations, and I don't think it's given away too much to say that she, find, she finds herself in a situation where she's the minority. Exactly. And um, she has a growth process there too. Right. So how did you think about taking her from being someone who was sort of closed-minded to accepting, to having love overtake her um, with John and then accepting the idea that she would have to take some risk if she were going to date this man of color. Yeah, well, I just, I just wondered what they were gonna do. You know, they go to a football game together on a date. Right. And then afterwards, all of her friends and their dates are going to fraternity parties on campus because that's what you do. Right. Well, there are no black fraternities in 1966. And so suddenly she and John have nowhere to go. And he says, um, do you like blues? And she's not used to, no, it was jazz. Right. And she's not used to jazz. She's used to rock and roll and whatever they're playing in the fraternity <laughs> parties. He takes her off campus right. to, a, to a joint, basically. And she's the only white person there. And I think it's, that's also part of her awakening because she has a conversation with John about, do you ever get used to this? Right. You're used to this uncomfortable feeling of being in the minor minority. You know? And I think that is what, one of the things that's very special about this book. So there are many different ways to take on these situations. Some can be, some can be very hard hitting, some can be very um, aggressive, and some can be very, um, and all of them can be thoughtful, but some of them can be just about the person's feelings and nothing more than that. And that takes the reader every place they need to go. And that's one, of the, that's one of the things that I think you were able to do successfully here. You were able to tell the story of something that's kind of, you know, that might be a little ups upsetting or controversial or uncomfortable for people, but all of the love that's around it, you know, takes, takes you someplace which, is, which helps us learn rather than maybe get our backs up. And I think that's where Mary Margaret goes. And Mary Margaret teaches us as readers um, about what we can learn and how we can learn and how we can approach these things. Um, I, you know, I was interviewed once and someone said that the, 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 the um, title of the podcast was, how do I speak about race without, become, without coming across as a racist? Mary Margaret kind of teaches you how to do that. Mary Margaret teaches you how to ex ex oh, have an open mind, how to ask appropriate questions of the, of the person, and then how to continue, in her case, it was more than a friendship, but you know, she could have continued a friendship based on the things that she learned. So let's go from her to John, which yeah. you had to do some research because, so you've got this woman who is, who, you know, from a very, um, you know, privileged background, and she's going to the school of her dreams. And then you've got this, um, African-American boy who is coming from a different world, different circumstances, and ends up in the same place. Right. Talk, talk a little bit about his, his backstory. Yeah, I had to do some research on John, um, and I had him be from a pretty much all-Black neighborhood in Memphis. Mm -hmm. He grows up, and his father coaches football at their school, and his, his older brother is going to go to college on a football scholarship, and that's what everybody expects him to do as well. Right. But he doesn't want to, you know, he wants to, he wants to go to Ole Miss. And, um, you know, this is just three, four years after James Meredith was there. Right. 
and, and he wants to study law. He wants to go to law school. He wants to make a change and make a difference by becoming a lawyer and hopefully eventually a judge. So I have some friends who are native Memphians and actually a couple of lawyers as well. So I had to ask for early readers to help me with things like what neighborhood should he live in? You know, uh, later if he does become a lawyer and a judge, you know, where shall I set his practice? And, and you know, some of these things because the book does span a lot of years. Right. And, um, and even as a little boy, you know, when he's riding his bicycle to the library, uh, you know, and he gets beat up by some white kids. We gets chased by some white kids who say, I hope you didn't get your cooties on our books. Right. Because th this was just when libraries were first allowing blacks. You know, they had been Negro branches that right. you had to go to, but he wanted to go to the main branch, you know. And uh, so his heart was just all about wanting to learn and, and, and was all about love and not fighting back. You know, well, uh, he, but he chose to fight back differently. Um, and say. so his goal is to become a uh, to become a judge, right. and where and he sees um, the ability to make change right. if if he can become that, in which right. he wants to go, and 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 he will have some, you know, pushback from his parents. He eventually goes there and meets her, and and this is where I don't really want to say anything because this is where it gets really beautiful, and this is where some of the the special stuff happens. But I do want to read a quote from you and have you react to this. Um, this is Miss Welty talking to Mary Margaret. Mary Margaret has been told by Eudora Welty, uh, has, has had a story of hers and she's read this story. She's come back to talk about it. She says, are all of your stories like this one? She asks Miss Welty. And she says, no, they're all different. But in each one, I try to get into the mind of the people I write about, even though they are fictional. That's the hard part about writing, but it also makes it so worthwhile. Yes. So what was so worthwhile about getting into the minds of Mary Margaret and John? Well, I grew, I think, I hope I grew as a person. I hope I, I expanded my ability to love. And, and accept, you know, and that story that Eudora Welter was referring to was the one that was published in the New Yorker that she fictionalized about the murder of Medgar Evers. Right. You know, and she wanted to get into his head, like, why did he do it? That's what she was trying to teach Mary Margaret there. But for me, go, getting into Mary Margaret and John's heads, um, it was about growth for me, you know, and I wanted to share that somehow. And I wanted to share it with a love story you know, and not with a didactic right. kind of preachy teaching kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I think the growth um, was was there, was obvious uh, in the characters. And, and as you said, you know, um, as you said that you grow uh, and the reader grows because what we know about novels, about fiction is that, you know, they inc increase the reader's um, ability to care. Um, they make readers feel more and, and are and thoughtful about things outside of the book, but issues re that are related to the book. So we become, we, we have more empathy. And so um, Robert Frost said, if there's no tears in the writer, there are no tears in the reader. So if I take that to mean that your experience is that you grew from that, and that's why when I read the book, I was able to grow from that. And I think that's your gift to uh, the, the public, the reading public in this book, is that you are going to teach people through, um, you know, what is a, could be a, a, a tortured storyline throughout our history, but you're going to teach us more about love, more about caring, more about understanding, because you chose to write this story. Thank you. Thank you. You know, when you mentioned earlier that I put quotes throughout the book, yeah. one of my favorite ones was about, was about what you're saying, and it was about William Faulkner. And he said, never be afraid to raise your voice for honesty and truth and compassion against injustice and lying and greed. If people all over the world would do this, it would change the earth. You know, you have to believe that. You have to have hope in the middle of where we are right now. I agree, and I think that's it's truly important for anybody, and I think writing fictional stories, creating stories that are there to create messages for people uh, to come away with, uh, you know, w after reading a book and be totally moved 
and changed by that, that book. And I think authors, uh, oftentimes when they take a chance and go out on a ledge a little bit is when the readers, we actually grow along with it. So I'm thankful that, that you did that. Um, before we, we run out of too much time, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about what um, I'm often asked about. And so I don't wanna escape this without asking you a little bit about your process, about your writing process. So um, what's your day-to-day -day schedule feel like? Can you write for eight hours? Can you write for four hours? Do you start in the morning? Do you start in the afternoon? Um, I don't really have a schedule. And that's the wonderful thing about this stage of my life. And I have some <laughs> writer friends who are much younger, who are raising children and or teaching school and writing. And they may get up at four in the morning to do some of this. And fortunately, because my kids are grown and I have this stage of my life where I can choose what I do with my time. So every day is different. You know, right now I'm in marketing mode. So, you know, I'm barely trying to start a new book, but it's really hard to switch your gears from marketing mode to creative mode. You know, right. once I do in a few weeks and I pour back into this new book, I will spend maybe two or three hours a day on it. I, I really can't go much longer than that without losing some energy. Right. You know, um, I can spend you now several more hours that day researching, right. being on social media, reading other books, which is super important, you yeah. know, uh, revising. But as far as the actual writing creative process, I can't go more than two or three hours at a time and sometimes even less, um, you know, to do that. So. And are you a, um, do you write with an outline or do you just um, start writing and see where the characters take you? Yes and yes. <laughs> Initially, I was an outliner. For Cherry Ball, my first novel, I outlined 16 chapters before I wrote the first sentence. Wow. I'm a real controller. I had to know where it was going before I could. And I have author friends who would say, oh, the characters just take on a life of their own. And I always thought that was crazy until I wrote the short stories for Friends of the Library. And for some reason with each of them, I started with a character and a setting because those two things are really important, especially right. if you're writing literary fiction, character in the setting. And then I did, like William Faulkner says, the, the characters just take off and you just right. take a pen and try to keep up with them. <laughs> that happened in those short stories. So someone asked me recently with a new novel that I'm starting, which way am I gonna go this time? And I've decided I'm gonna start out with the new way. I've got my character and I've got my setting. I have some ideas about the plot but I'm not gonna outline. I'm gonna try to follow the characters and see where they lead me. And um, because it worked with these short stories and that's the most fun I've ever had writing. So you've grown, you become freer as, a, as an author then. You've, you've <laughs> taken off some of the controls to, to see um, where the story can take you. I hope so, we'll that's, see. That's bold in, its, in and of itself, right? <laughs> we'll see how long I last going that way, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think that you know, plotting this book um, with the, the, the dual, maybe triple storylines going through, through here um, to make sure that you're, and, you're, and you, as you said, you're crossing a large period of time. Right. Um, there was, what, what was more difficult for you in terms of, um, you know, keeping everything in, in you know, intact in terms of following the years and the chronological part of it, or just making sure that you were hitting things in the right historical point. I mean, there's, I know there's, a, I think there's a, a protest at Ole Miss, you know, you had to hit at the right time. You had to bring the characters there at the right time. Right. Um, so what, what was more important for you there or more difficult, I guess? Even though I wasn't actually outlining, mm -hmm. as the chapters progressed, I found myself putting a date on each chapter and that's okay. also in the table of contents right um, so that i wouldn't get lost and so that my readers wouldn't get lost yeah. and and there are chapters in mary margaret's voice and their chapters in john's voice so you know they kind of go back and forth but other than the um the um prologue which is in set in 2015 and then it goes back to the beginning in the 50s it pretty much goes in chronological order from there you know it's not as difficult as these books that you read that jump back and forth back and forth a lot of historical novels are doing right. that now right this was a little easier to 
to keep track of um, in that way. So what made you choose to use the different voices rather than having a narrator tell both their stories? I don't know if I really know. <laughs> Mel doesn't play as big a part in this book as she did in the short stories. Right, right. She's, she's a little more in the background in, in these. She doesn't even appear in some chapters. Right, that's right. Yeah. So I, and again, since I was getting into John and Mary Margaret's heads, I felt like I needed to write in their voices. Right. Even though it's third person, I still yeah. felt like that's... I needed to write in their voices. Right. Yeah. So... Um, oh, I, we're running out of time here. So let me, before we ask a question, um, is there anything else that I might have missed that you want to say about um, John and Mary Margaret and, um, you know, anything about the, whatever you feel? Okay, sure. You mentioned this protest um, yeah. in 1970 on the Ole Miss campus, which was in February of 70 of my freshman year. There was a musical group that came to campus called Up With People. And I know my husband and I went to that concert. I know other friends went. But um, as I was writing this book and doing research, I discovered that there was a huge protest the night of the concert. And over 60 Black students were arrested. Highway patrol cars, blue lights were everywhere. And I just thought, wow, how, how, how could I have missed that? I asked my husband. He, he didn't remember it. I asked numerous other people who had been at Ole Miss with us. Finally, I got to a person who knew what happened. The concert was more than one night. And evidently, we went on the night that uh -huh. the protest did not happen. We uh -huh. couldn't have missed it because these students came in, walked up the aisle of the concert, jumped up on the stage and took the microphone. <laughs> I mean, there's no way that we would have missed it, you know? Right. So, um, the John, I should have said this, is based on two uh, of those characters. They're called the Ole Miss Eight. Eight of those 60 are known as Ole Miss Eight. And they were um, expelled from school. And some of them came back later, some didn't. And um, so in the epilogue at the end, I have them coming to a reunion in 2020 which actually happened on campus. They had a reunion of the Ole Miss Eight. Uh -huh. And there's a character named Diana in the book. And she's based on one of those, um, a woman who didn't, was not allowed to receive her diploma, even though she had done all the work for it. 50 years later, they gave her her diploma. Wow. And uh, so, you know, that's what the epilogue, maybe that's giving away too much. But no, I don't think so. <laughs> to give you the sense that I'm using real historical um events in with the fictional book. Yeah. Right, right. Well, I think it's important to, to place, even though you're doing, uh, you're creating um, fictional characters, I think it just helps everybody to put the story in perspective and in context uh, when you're using um, historical events that particularly people in um, the area would know and recognize. And I know, I also know that a lot of people um, who live in this in the cities that you represent in your book will will find it fun to you know, to, yeah. you know to, to to read oh I know that or, or or you know that kind of thing so I think that's good. Thank you. Um, so should we bring back in Nicole to see if she has any more questions? Hi Nicole. Hello again. Okay, that was amazing, amazing conversation. Thank you. Um, we have got a couple of questions from the audience. I think one kind of addressed already, um, Karen Clausen had asked for actually both authors though, uh, to discuss their writing process, but also how it was impacted by COVID. So now Susan, we heard a little bit about uh, your normal writing process. Did that change during COVID? And then Jeffrey, love to hear what your process is like too. Okay. Yeah, actually COVID was good for me. I mean, the first month or two, I was in a funk. I ate junk food and watched TV and you know, <laughs> rest and mad. And then all of a sudden, I think my husband said, now, you know, as a writer, you're always wanting time alone so you can write. You can't go have lunch with your friends. Right. You can't go anywhere or do anything. So isn't this perfect? And so I wrote the book in about three months mm -hmm. um, because I couldn't go anywhere or do anything else. You know, plus I was being inspired by some things that were going on as far as in the social injustice world. So what about you, Jeffrey? Uh, well, my process has changed over time when I was working full time and, and trying to, to write. It was whenever you could find time. I had the, uh, you know, when I was working on nightly news, um, we had a schedule that went from started at 11 
um, in the morning and went until after the newscast or whatever else. If something happened, we would stay as long as we need to stay, but it was kind of 11 to 7.30. And so when the kids would go to school, um, I'd get up and I'd write when Jean was off to work and I'd write or, and then sometimes when I was overwhelmed by carrying the characters around and you just had to get it out, I would stay up late and, and write that way. Um, uh, I was able to finish Evan Walls um, after leaving NBC and retiring. And um, I agree with you, there's a limit. So for me, it's probably about four, four and a half hours um, that I can write and then I have to get up and, and walk away um, and exercise um, or something. Um, I can't, I, I will say that having a wonderful afternoon or morning or whatever it is of writing um, is one of the most satisfying feelings um, that I have in my life. Um, and so that's very special. Um, as far as COVID goes, I agree the, when it first started, um, I found it a little difficult to even read a book um, because you know, part of, part of the, the journalism part of me was, was uh, started again. And so we were just reading papers and watching television and trying to figure out where things are going. And um, so there was all of that. And then after we sort of got settled into our routine of being in the house and, and really just taking walks during the day and that sort of thing, um, the writing came easier. Um, and, the and the concentration time mm -hmm. came easier. Um, and I do believe that, uh, you know, the book I'm, I'm almost finished now with my next novel and that I think that there is, um, I've just really enjoyed having the time to focus on that and, and not much else. So, so for a certain part of the time, it's been really good for me. Great. Thanks for that question, Karen, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> okay, our next one's from Lori O'Brien. Um, she says, how much did the book The Help weigh into the way you approach this book? Susan, I know you know that author and you've had similar experiences. Yeah, um, and of course, Catherine Stockett wrote that. Um, she and I are both from Jackson, Mississippi. So she was writing about my hometown. And I remember reading it and watching the movie and, and thinking, actually thinking back then that I might eventually want to write something and set it there. She was pretty brave to do that. And of course, she's gotten praise and criticism, you know, for, for various things. You know, one thing was for the dialect was, and, and and she used a completely different dialect when the African-American people, the help, the domestic help, when they were working in the white homes and when they were in their own homes and with their own friends. And, you know, I mean, Jeffrey can say whether or not she did a good job of that. But I remember thinking that I didn't want to use much dialect in this book, because unless you do it just right, it, it distracts the reader. It either offends people or it distracts. Jeffrey, I don't know if you can speak to that. Well, there's, there's heavy dialect in um, the Emancipation of Evan Walls. And <clears throat> for, for two reasons, um, the, the main one being, uh, I was very big on creating a setting that I knew and that uh, I, could re I could write from my soul. And that setting included the old folks that I grew up around. And the way they spoke, I know I've often said a lot of people say, well, what's the music of your youth? And I know a lot of people I grew up with would say the Jackson Five or Earth, Wind and Fire or something. Right, right. Um, but for me, the music of my youth was the sound of my great grandmother's voice, my grandmother's voice, my great aunt and uncle. And I would sit at their feet and listen <laughs> to them talk. And for me to write the story set in the time that it was in the late 60s, early 70s and not use those voices would be fraudulent. And so I had to use um, those, those uh, voices. Um, I think it's a very difficult thing for um, your friend um, who wrote the help giving, and you said, you know, she received some negativity. Um, my, thing, my thing is, you know, in, if you watch the movie, um, uh, The Green Book, there was also some, some of the same issues there. So here's my, my um, also maybe controversial stance on that. If you live a life, and if she grew up in that household, she grew up having uh, black women who worked in her home. And, and like the guy in Green Book, he spent time on the road with this black man. Right. When someone steps into your life, they become a part of your life. They become a part of your story. And you have 
the absolute right to tell your story and how that person fit into your life. It may not be the whole story, right. um, but you can't ever tell the whole story about anybody. You can only tell your perspective. And so um, that's my feeling about that. Um, and so if she were, if she did use dialect and she heard that dialect and she can recreate that dialect, um, then that's okay with me. Uh, if you do it wrong, people will let you know. <laughs> But again, we talked about, as Faulkner said, authors need to take chances um, and they need to reach across those lines because that's how we as authors educate ourselves and that's how we eventually will educate our audiences. Absolutely. Um, right. Okay, we have got Vicki Jackson wants to know, when Mary Margaret meets John again after so many years, has she grown in such a way that she understands more deeply what John's background was like growing up? Oh, wow. Hey, Vicki, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, you know, I didn't talk a lot about what happens years later. Um, Mary Margaret becomes a school teacher in Memphis. And one thing she does is she um, is in charge of uh, a diversity club at the high school that she teaches at, you know, and, and, and she wants her students and her own children, her own daughters, uh, to have an awareness, you know, uh, about, about racial things. And I think that when she does, meet John again, certainly she's grown. It's 35 years later. And certainly she's grown a lot. And and their relationship and what happens then will show that. I think it'll show a lot of that growth. John's also grown, you know, in in, in different ways. They they both have, obviously, you know, they were they were 18 and then they were 35 years older, you know. So thanks for the question, Vicky. And a while ago, John was mentioning his book, and I meant to say more about that, y'all. The, the Emancipation of Evan Walls, his most recent book, is one of the books and the resources in mine. And it's wonderful, and it's beautifully done, too. So I recommend that, too. <laughs> and we've got copies of that on display at Novel right when you walk in. And Tuesday is the official release date for John and Mary Margaret. So you will see those on that same display come Tuesday and in the meantime, I dropped links for all of the books in the chat, um, or you can go just over to novelmemphis.com and place your orders now. Um, I think that is all we've got for questions, unless I've got anything else. Um, anything else that you guys want to talk about, have coming up? Well, um, I can. I, I am working on a, another novel and um, it's about, a, a Tragic Fall from Grace by a Black billionaire, of which there are about eight or nine in this country. And um, it's about redemption and whether or not we can find redemption in the age of social media, um, where you can't run and hide as he thought he could. <clears throat> and when you can, and if redemption occurs, what does it look like? And my selling point in this book is that uh, redemption can look like saving your neighbor. And that's, and that's um, where that, and that's the story I'm working on, on now. Wow, I can't wait. That sounds awesome. <laughs> that sounds great. Well, I have written just a few pages of a new book um, and it's going to be set in my very favorite place in the world which is Seaside, Florida. Well, Sea Grove Beach, Florida is my favorite place where I always stay. Seaside is right next door and it's such a charming little town that I'm actually gonna set it there. And it's going to involve, it's gonna be all about friendship and to what lengths people will go in friendships um, to, to really love someone when they need it. And these women are in a bridge club and um, it also involves Alzheimer's, which I keep revisiting because my mother died from Alzheimer's. And so I wrote the memoir first. It's in one of my short stories, Alzheimer's. Also, we didn't talk about it today, but it's involved in John and Mary Margaret's story as well. And it's gonna show up again in this next novel, unless I change my mind, I'm early into the writing. So we'll see, but I have, where they take you. Yeah, I have one more question for you. Um, when, when I first went out on the tour for um, Evan Walls, so, someone said to me, it stood up and asked a question, which seems like it should be a question everybody would ask you, but I only got it this one time and I, I really liked it. And, and she said, when I finish your book and I close the covers, 
what do you want me to feel? What do you hope I'm thinking? So I'm asking you the same question. What do you hope the readers are thinking when they close the book? Wow. Of course, everybody brings something different to the book when they yeah, read it. Absolutely. So it's so it's so it's so hard for me to assume anything, and I don't want to assume anything about my about my readers. But I'm thinking about again, Eudora Welty, because I, I learned so much from her, and and she says that it the challenge to writers today is not to disown any part of our heritage, and um you know, and there's a lot of, lot going on. Yeah. about that in our country right now and how do we deal with that it's a very complicated issue and i'm hoping that maybe even my even though my book is not uh heavily academic in any way i'm hoping that it will maybe open hearts to think about that a little bit and uh and also here's one more from james baldwin to accept one's past one's history is not the same thing as drowning in it it is learning how to use it so these two very different people who both have influenced me and influenced the writing in the book, James Balding and Eudora Welty, I think are, are sending a message to me and I don't wanna preach you know, to my readers. I want everybody to take what they need from it and hopefully they'll find hope. Hopefully they'll find hope and love um, and not anger. That's hope and love. That's what I want them to take from it. There you go. Those are great things. Well, thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Jeffrey and Susan. Thank you. This was fantastic. Um, we have been recording this, so we will try to get this posted. It'll probably be tomorrow afternoon on our YouTube channel, which is just Novel Events. Um, and you can head to novelmemphis.com to order both of the books now or stop by the store. And the book will be out on Tuesday. Thanks so much, you guys. Thank you very much. Thanks to everybody. Good luck, Susan, on your tour. Good luck. Thanks. We'll stay Thanks. in touch. All right. Bye-bye.